Paul Barber has a long history in professional football, having been active in the industry for nearly 25 years. His current post is Chief Executive and Deputy Chairman of Brighton & Hove Albion Football Club. He was the very first marketing director of the Football Association, and he is credited for modernizing and commercializing the organization. His initiatives have focused on supporting English football, women's football, youth academy systems, and making the sport accessible for disabled players. In the past, he has also held senior positions at Vancouver Whitecaps FC and Tottenham Hotspurs FC. To this day, Barber is still making strides in the world of football with his current team. Roberto De Zerbi is a distinguished football manager and former player who is currently the head coach of the Premier League club Brighton & Hove Albion. He is among the 100 youngest managers and the 13th Italian to be a head coach in Premier League history. His knack for coaching has earned him respect and he has become admired for the tactical approach that he has demonstrated in his work at Sesualo and Shakhtar. Ladies and gentlemen, we are thrilled to be in conversation with Paul and Roberto this evening. So please, put your hands together for Paul Barber and Roberto De Zerbi, and your host for this evening, me. So good evening. Um, and welcome, Paul, Roberto, and Enrico. Uh, thank you, all three, for coming to be in conversation with me at Rockwater this evening. How are we? Very good, thanks. Good. You're looking very suave and chic. Um, so, Paul, can I start with you? Is that okay? Um, so, before becoming... I'm going straight in on the questions. Before becoming part of the football scene, you worked in quite a few non-sporting companies, but you, you always had an utter love for the game. So how did you come to work in football? Was it always a plan? Um, well, I've loved football all my life. Yeah. Wasn't good enough to play at the level that, uh, that we work at now, um, but still enjoyed it. Enjoyed coaching for a while, kids for a, over a decade, um, but always wanted to, to find a way to work in a professional game. And luckily enough, in late 1996, the FA gave me that opportunity. Um, and here I am, 25 years later yeah absolutely so what was the first job what was your what was your first job in football well I was based at uh, Lancaster Gate I was yeah. advising um, the Football Association on their World Cup bid for 2006 so you work nearly 10 years ahead to to plan for a World Cup wow. um, we failed in that bid um, but um, I must have done something to give the FA a reason to hire me on a on a full-time basis soon after that okay and now, Roberto, I'm going to ask you a question. So looking at the start of your career, you played as a, an attacking mid midfielder. When did you realise you wanted... Number 10. Number 10. <laughs> yeah. Number 10, OK, the attacking midfielder. Oh, because number 10 explains better, no? Oh, does it? OK. Uh, because number 10 uh, is different uh, in head before. Okay. Because he's... Um, he's creative. Uh, yeah. Makes things happen. Uh, okay, creative and make different. things happen. Yeah, it's different. Thank you. Because if I get it wrong, I'd like to be told, and then I can learn something. So when did you realise that football was going to... You wanted f football as your career? How old were you? For me, uh, to become a player uh, was a dream, you know? Yeah. Um, um, at, when I was uh, 11, 10 years, um, I, I, I already wanted in my, my head to, to become a player, to play in Serie A. Uh, and the same was uh, when I... Uh, when I um, started to think to become a coach. Same. Yeah, same. I love uh, this sport. Yeah. Uh, for, for me, it's not a passion, it's more than a, a passion. It's my life, no? And yeah. uh, my family knows uh, that the, the football 
uh, is on the on the the first place in, in your my life. In your life. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we was, we, before we came down, we were speaking, Roberto said he doesn't have time to go to class to better his English because he's working all the time. I mean, in doing these podcasts, it has been really interesting, um, especially sportsmen, actually, and sportswomen. It's, it is your life. Yes, I want to be um, more uh, precious and uh, Enrico, my angel, uh, help me. Uh, help me to be more, uh, more precious. Um, il calcio per me è stato tutto. Uh, football for me is everything. È stato un riscatto sociale. It has been something in my life that gave me something also in a social aspect. Perché io davo soddisfazione alla mia famiglia giocando. Because my family was so happy and were receiving a lot of satisfaction seeing me playing football. E mi ha dato la possibilità di comprare la casa ai miei genitori. Football gave me also the opportunity to buy a house for my parents. Di conoscere tanta gente, di visitare paesi diversi, la Romania quando giocavo, l'Ucraina, l'Inghilterra adesso. To know a lot of people and also to visit a lot of countries when I was a former player in Romania and then like a head coach in Ukraine first and then in UK. Mi ha formato come uomo. I have been formed like a human. Mi ha formato il carattere. Of course, also the character has been formed by the football. Mi ha fatto ridere, mi ha fatto piangere. I had moments where I was laughing and I was crying also. Io ho dato tutto al calcio. I gave everything to football. E ho preso tutto dal calcio. And I have received everything from football. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you. So, Paul, you recently celebrated... 10 years as Brighton and Hove Albion's chief executive. And previously, I think I'm right in saying you've kind of normally in companies stay for three to five years. So I'm sorry for having to point this out, but it's been a decade already. Um, so what is it about Brighton and Hove Albion that's kind of, you're there, I mean, it's 11 years now, is that you're going into your 11th year? Yeah, I'm a bit nervous that Enrico's going to start translating what I say. <laughs> I'd be quite worried. Um, um, well, Brighton's a really special city, first of all. I think it's, um, it's a fantastic mm. community, diverse community, welcoming community. Um, I was first attracted to Tony Bloom's vision for the club and, and um, the, the brief that he gave me to effectively create a Premier League setup um, and work with people good enough to help get us to the Premier League and then stay there. And every year has been different. Every year we've had a different challenge. We've um, progressed. We've added great infrastructure, the stadium, the training ground. We've hired really good coaches to work with, great technical staff, great staff in all areas of the club. Um, and all the while, we've improved on the pitch. We've bought and sold a lot of players. We've played good football. We've entertained people. We've grown the fan base. And... When I first came to Brighton a decade ago, I used to drive along the seafront and see the kids playing football on Hove lawns. And there were Spurs shirts, there were Liverpool shirts, there were Manchester United shirts, there was the odd Brighton shirt. Now when I drive along the seafront, there's a lot of Brighton shirts on the kids' yeah. backs, and I love that. I bet. It's amazing. So it became Premier League in 2016-2017 season. It ended a 34-year absence of being in the top tier. I mean, it's amazing. So how did that transform the club on a business financial level? Well, well overnight, our, our turnover went from around 25 million to 125 million. So wow. you, you immediately get this incredible uplift. Um, when the stadium opened in, in 2011, we had crowds of around 18,000. We're now around 32,000 every week. Um, and I think globally now, people recognise Brighton as a Premier League football club. Um, and that's really special. And it doesn't matter which country in the world you go to, you'll see a Brighton shirt, you'll hear people talking about the club. Um, and, you know, that's partly down to the work of, obviously, the players on the pitch who've done a fantastic job and the coaching staff, um, but also a lot of staff behind the scenes that have helped to grow the club commercially. Yeah. Um, and that's really important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Roberto... In 2013, you retired as a player. What made you decide to then become a coach? From a player to a coach. 
Well, I started to think to become a, the, a coach before to before to the end of um, the the play the player career, mm -hmm. no? Uh, for two for two two things, no? The, the first, uh, uh, when a player uh, finish to play is a mm, bad moment, eh? mm -hmm. and because uh, you are used to to stay all time in a dressing room and the day after he can start another life and uh, and for this i i i thought to to start to 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 coach to to training to stay always in my life always in my yeah in my what was in before and uh, day by day um mi sono innamorato, no? I fall in love. To, to, to explain the, my player, my idea. Yeah. When you... It's different because when you... Uh, when you are a player, you have to think only for you. When you become a coach, uh, you have to think for 20 people. And uh, the the best is uh, when uh, your idea um, is fatta da, da 20 persone. Yeah, when yes, it, your idea is made by 20 people. Yeah. Because uh, when 20 people follow you is a, a, a fantastic uh, moment. Absolutely. So when... I was going to, oh, I've got a few questions about your style of coaching. Um, but when you're, when you come and you're coaching and you're managing the players who are all individual, all very different people, how do you coach that many people? Is it like one kind of shoe fits all or do you kind of coach them slightly individually? No, no. <clears throat> uh... Every person is different. Yeah, you know? that's why. And uh, you have uh, a lot of kind of a lot of way to arrive in uh, in different people. No? Yeah, that's what that and, I kind of thought. Uh, the the psychological aspect is uh, one of the the best, the most important aspect for my my work. Yeah, Abs oh, yeah, I can see. So, and uh, you're a coach now. And have you taken, is there anyone that coached you that inspired you or some coach that also taught you, I'm never going to do that? I think uh, I would like to improve uh, until the day before to... To, to die. Yeah. I thought you might say that. <laughs> uh, no, no, because yeah. uh, now I am uh, I'm working in Premier League, no? Yeah. And I can think uh, it's finished the time when I... Uh, have to to improve. It's not it's not so. I I'm, it's not like this. I would like improve in um, every day. Yeah. And um, I I watch the game in uh, TV, for example, and to to take something uh, to other coaches. But uh, the most important is to be. Um, myself, no, to uh, essere, essere me stesso. Yeah, to be myself is the most important yes, thing. To be, to be clear, to be honest, uh, and in terms of idea of uh, the style of play, I I I want to to learn uh, the new idea, but uh, I I have my idea. Yeah. I think your vision. I've been very clear. Yeah. I don't know if. Uh, uh, is my idea is uh, good or no, but my idea in my head is uh, very clear. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? When you it is amazing when you think that you're kind of dealing with that many people. People can be difficult, can't they? Sometimes. Yes, but I am the I am. Io sono uno dei più difficili. Yeah, but uh, I'm one of the most difficult ones. So. Well, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't want to say anything. We were actually moving no, on to that later. Perché... 
perché se, se sei difficile riesci a capire le persone difficili because if you are difficult no you can understand the difficult people <laughs> so Before. true yeah because after is easier no yeah absolutely and he did tell us this at the interview stage that yeah he, that he could be okay. difficult so that's, that's okay. fine yeah that's fine i can tell how passionate you are about your job you've got a good one there haven't you paul He's really good. Yeah, um, I can tell. He was, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he was number one on our list. Um, we which knew is, a lot of... Yeah, which we, is my next question. Well, there we go. Yeah. We, we knew a lot about Roberto. We, we knew a lot about what he'd achieved at Sassuolo and what he was achieving at Shakhtar before the war started. And I think when we, we first met, um, we were very impressed not only with his knowledge of our club and our players and the league, but also you know, the amount of effort that, that he made to speak in English. And, and, you know, although Enrico is fantastic, um, you know, we were really impressed with, with Roberto's desire to, to work with us and to work in England. And his work ethic, he warned us, was that he would be in the training ground many, many hours every day. And uh, he, he certainly has done that and continues to do that. Yeah. This is like a Quite live a appraisal coach, for him, isn't, isn't it? I know. <laughs> So a manager can leave clubs very abruptly, like um, Graham's departure earlier this year was a shock to the fans. But how difficult is it for the players to have a manager leave so quickly and a new manager come on board and then the players adapting to a new manager, stroke coaches, training and coaching? Yeah, I mean, Roberto is probably better placed yeah. to, to answer that. But from our point of view... Um this happens in football and yeah. we have to be prepared for it. Um, it's never easy when um, a club with a lot of money comes for your, your best staff, but we take it as a big compliment that the work that Graham and the coaching staff did put them at a, a level that they would attract interest from clubs like Chelsea. Um, we have to have a plan for that happening and replacing those people very quickly. And, uh, you know, we, we have a, a list of, of candidates that we consider to be the best coaches that, that, that we can work with. And Roberto was the top of that list. He was the only person that we spoke to and, and we're delighted that it was here. But in terms of the players, players are pretty resilient. You know, yeah. the king is dead, long live the king, and the new king is here. Yeah, absolutely. It's part, it is part of the story of football, isn't it? But do you, um, do you ever get a slight little warning? Did you, you know, how, did you, how much warning did you have that Graham was leaving? Or do you always looking in case you need to replace them? We're, all, we're always sort of aware of, of, of who the coaches are, the best coaches around that we would, we would want to work with should we lose a coach. Mm. Um, in terms of warning, um, I got a phone call about half past seven in the morning from Chelsea's owner to say that they'd like to speak to Graham. Um, and, you know... If all those talks went well, then the chances are they would hire him. So, you know, we get no more warning than that. Um, we can create good clauses in our contracts to protect ourselves. But at the end of the day, um, if someone wants to move to progress their career, to work with a, a club uh, that's bigger, playing at a higher level, um, earn more money, um, then all we can do is protect ourselves as best we can. And in this case, it's financially. So, you know, Chelsea had to pay a very significant sum of compensation to, to take Graham away um, but we were delighted uh, that Roberto was available to speak to us sad circumstances yeah. because he wouldn't have been available if, if the war in Ukraine hadn't have happened he was doing a fantastic job at Shakhtar um, but he was available and we met we got on pretty well we still get on pretty well um, <laughs> and um, <laughs> it's going well so far <laughs> hey, and Roberto I'm a bit long but uh... <laughs> Six hour, but it was it was nice. Good. I think I think it's worth saying that you know when when you first meet a new manager, you don't know whether the meeting is going to be a thirty minute meeting or a a many hours meeting. No. And um, I think you know David Weir's at the back of the room. He was in that meeting, uh, our technical director, and we met Roberto and Enrico for many hours. And that's a, a very good sign because there was an immediate chemistry. We got on very well. Uh, there was a good sense of humour. Yeah. The only thing that worried us was that Roberto understood David's Scottish accent more than he understood mine and Tony Bloom's, <laughs> which is very worrying. Yes. Yes. And so, Roberto, you, ha you haven't lived in England before. How are, you finding, how are you finding it? How are you adapting to life here? Well, um, I was in, uh, in Romania for two years, uh, in, in Ukraine for uh, eight months. For me, um, 
I feel good in every uh, in every country if uh, there is a, a good people. Yeah. I have not a problem, and uh, I'm lucky because in uh, in Brighton I I fought uh, good people, good players, and and for me it was uh, easier to 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 start to work. No. Yeah. For me and for my staff. So, how many coaches are there out on your staff? Uh, we are nine. 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 That's a lot of coaches, isn't it? A lot of coaches. Very expensive. Very expensive. <laughs> Worth every penny, though. Yes, when I when I will speak uh, a proper English, uh, Rico. <laughs> but, but Eight. Goes back in Eight. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pleasure with all of you guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's a good point, actually, because when, when, yeah. when we explained to the chairman that Enrico came with Roberto, um, because obviously, you know, Roberto's English was, 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 was good, but, but not as good as he'd like it to be, and that Enrico would be the translator, the chairman's first question was, well, when Roberto learns English, what happens to Enrico? <laughs> um, but he's already established himself as a really important part of the, of the team, and, and Enrico is much more than just a translator. So uh, yeah. we're delighted that Enrico's here. Oh, I will be happy 100% uh, when I will able to to speak uh, English like not like Italian, but um, like uh, David Weir. Close, no, because. Uh, with player is not a problem, but uh, for example, in uh, in this evening, no, I would like to speak uh, better to explain me better, no, to uh, to you know me better, no. Yeah, absolutely. If you subscribe to a fabric of life coloured by the sea, subscribe to Open Water from Rockwater for exclusive performances by international recording artists and world-class musicians, celebrity talks, and stand-up comedy, to film screenings by firesides, well-being workouts and beach-bound meditation. Open Water gives you exclusive access to the best that Rockwater has to offer. Played out over three floors, just a stone's throw from the water with remarkable food and drink experiences for company. To find out more, contact the team today. Open water at rockwater.uk. Open water, made by the sea. So Roberto, um, before coming here, coming to Brighton, you were manager, head manager in Ukraine. And I understand this is an emotional topic for you, but I wondered if you wouldn't mind if we speak about it a little, because um, I think it's important to hear first-hand experiences uh, of the most horrific, life-altering experiences of war. It was a, a particular experience, no? Until the, the day when uh, we started the war. Uh, and... Um, for me, it's still very painful, and I think it will stay forever. Because, of course, people are still knowing me not the good. Però per lavorare bene, io ho bisogno del rapporto di 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 del rapporto con con i miei giocatori, con i miei dirigenti. But for me, in terms of working good, I need to have a very strong relationship with my players and with my club managers. E così era stato in Ukraina, coi giocatori, coi dirigenti, col presidente. And exactly like that, it happened in Ukraine with my players, with the chairman, with the club. E stavamo creando una grande squadra. And we were creating a great team. E quindi non per yeah. colpa tua da un giorno all'altro finisce tutto. And of course it has finished everything from the night to the next day and it was not your fault. Yeah, horrific. So you had in the team, your the Ukrainian team, 13 was it 13 Brazilian players? Yes. And um, any any more international players that were lived in different places and how many Ukrainians were in your team? Yes, one um Un israeliano e un Burkina Faso. Yeah, there was one player from Israel and another one from Burkina Faso. So, and you, you stayed in the hotel with the coaches 
and... With Enrico. And, and Enrico, obviously, the angel. And you, you wouldn't leave until you knew all your players were safe. But, uh, you prima di... Before, before to be a coach, I'm a yeah. father. I have two children, 19 and 17. E il giorno che è scoppiata la guerra in hotel non c'erano più dirigenti. And the day the conflict started inside of the hotel, there were no manager of the club left. Quindi il riferimento per questi giocatori ero solo io, no? So the only reference for those players was me. Ma io non ero più l'allenatore. But in that moment I was not anymore the head coach. Ero qualcosa di più. I was something more. E quindi avevo mia figlia che piangeva al telefono. So there was my daughter that she was crying by phone. Arrabbiata con me perché non tornavo a casa. She was very angry with me because I wasn't coming back home. E non capiva perché rimanessi là, no? And she wasn't understanding why, why I was staying there. Poi dopo quando sono tornato che i giocatori brasiliani mi chiamavano al telefono, ho capito. Then when I came back home in Italy and Brazilian players will, were calling me, my daughter has understood why I decided to be like that. No, absolutely. I, I think, I did I, how many Ukrainians were actually in the team, did you say? Was it fi five? Uh, Twelve, 30. I mean, it must be so difficult. And if they stay to fight? No. No. No, 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 no. Uh, the people who work in the inside of the club, uh, someone, yeah, uh, or the players, no. Thank you. Um, I know it's really difficult to talk about, but actually, um, two of my best friends in London are hosting Ukrainian families, and I visit two girls, and one's 24 and one's 16, and their mum came over and had to drop them off and go back to look after her dad and her husband and her son that are fighting. So I have close contact with them and I, when you speak to them and you see in their, in their eyes what they're going through, it's, I just really wanted to speak to you about it because I think it's just really important to hear what's going on. I learned uh, one thing in, uh, in that moment, no? Che qua noi in Inghilterra, in Italia... I have learned that uh, in the UK, in Italy, non ci accorgiamo di alcune cose che abbiamo perché le diamo per scontate. Sometimes we cannot realize what we have because we think that what we have it's normal. E in quei giorni non c'era niente di normale. And in those days there there was nothing normal. E, e ho imparato ad apprezzare quel popolo, il popolo ucraino. And they have appreciated a lot the Ukrainian people. Per la dignità, per l'orgoglio. For per... the dignity, for mm. being very proud of being Ukrainian. Per l'attaccamento al loro paese. Because they are very patriot. Per la libertà. Because they are fighting for the freedom. Perché la libertà noi la diamo per scontata, ma non è così. Because we think that the freedom is something normal, but it's not like that. No. Su sembro di fare il filosofo, ma invece sono allenatore, però... It seems to be I'm like a philosoph, but at the end I'm a head coach. Yeah. But thank you for sharing that with us, sir. Thank you. When you left U the, the Ukraine team, they were the top in the Premier League, and I read one day that you'd like to go back and work there again. Not just yet, Roberto. <laughs> Not yet. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I would like uh, to, to, mm, to come back in, in Ukraine one day yeah. because uh, I think he's not close the... No. Uh, the question, the... Okay, with another uh, squad and another team, other players, maybe. Yeah. But... Um, um, will be nice for me. Yeah. Not for, for them. I don't know for the Shakhtar, but for me... Yeah. Will be nice, will be... Um, should be very important. Yeah. I can totally understand. So, Paul, now to you. Um, you have played a huge part in improving the club's performance, both on and off the field. So what is it like running a Premier Club? Is there anything as a typical day? Or is it all different? What goes um, on? Every day is different. Um, it, obviously, it's much easier to, to run any football club if you're doing well on the pitch. Yeah. The, the job's much easier. Um, if you're winning, walking along the seafront is a pleasure. If, if you're not winning, 
You wear as many hats as you possibly can. <laughs> um, but, um, but, but no, it's, it, as I said before, this is a special city. There's something about this city that is, um, that is really, really welcoming. It's a great place to live. The football club's a big part of it. Um, the fans have been brilliant in the, in the 10 years that I've been here. And we've, we've had some really good times. We've had one or two difficult times. But, but mainly it's been a, uh, you know, a lot of progress in a, in a relatively short period of time. So it's, it's been very positive. So, yeah, so every day is different. Every day is different because you never really know um, what's around the corner in football. It's, it's the biggest sport in the country. Um, in some ways, the job that I do is like any other job of a chief executive running a, a business. But the, the real difference is that everything we do is closely scrutinised and dissected and debated and discussed in the pub, in the office, in the workplace, wherever that is. And it can be great when, as I said, results are going well, but if they're not going well, then everything is, is more difficult. And so the job's unpredictable because of that. And one day we could be dealing with a, um, a, an issue with one of our sponsors or a positive thing, or another day there could be an incident on the pitch that requires support for Roberto and his staff with the FA or the Premier League. Another day we could be involved in a, a terrible community incident. We had the Shoreham air crash in 2015 that you know, was literally on, on the club's doorstep at the training ground. And that put us into a world that we weren't at all familiar with or comfortable with. But as an important organisation within the community, we, we had to step up and, and do the right thing. So you, you really never know in this job what's around the corner. All you can do is hope that you represent the community well, that the football club does well, the fans are enjoying what we're doing, and that you ultimately run the business as efficiently as you can for the owner. Um, because football clubs are expensive businesses Think, yeah. to run um, and our job is to try and be as successful as possible and reduce our dependency on Tony Bloom as much as we can. Thank you. Do you have a favourite part of your job? Is there a favourite part that you love doing most because you do lots so many Match day because there's nothing Ma I can do. Yeah you sit back um, then yeah. Yeah because at the end of the day our job during the week is to try and make it as easy as possible for these guys to win football matches and if we've done our jobs properly uh, we can on a, on a match day sit back and let Roberto and the players take the pressure and if we win then we can all celebrate that that success. But if we lose, it's not just their responsibility, it's ours as well, because somewhere, somehow in the process, we haven't done as much as we could have done to, to, to make it as easy as possible for them to win games. And at the end of the day, you know, we're in a high performance industry where winning is really, really important. Yeah. And uh, we want to do that every week, but we also know that so does everyone else. So it's not always going to happen. No, thank you. And so the, uh, the Amazon Prime documentary on Wrexham Football Club has been a huge success and people love seeing behind the scenes and the inner workings. Have you watched it? Yes. Um, I'm glad it's not us. Um, okay, I won't ask the next question. <laughs> we've, we've, actually, we've actually produced our own documentary which will be released in the new year. Oh. Which will chart the last 25 years of the club's um, history. Um, really from Hereford to pretty much where we are now. So that will be something we think our fans will enjoy watching. Um, there's a lot of fantastic footage in there, a lot of interviews with, with key people over the years, with players, with coaches, with obviously the owner, and some of the directors and some of the staff. Um, and it also gives a, a few glimpses as to how we've got to, to where we've got to. And um, the key part of the documentary is to, to really celebrate what's been achieved here from a club that almost went out of business and out of the league to a club that currently sits seventh in the Premier League. So you started document you doing documenting it back then and all the way not, through all not, of you? Not so much. A lot of archive footage has been used. Um, and we've been working with Matt Lorenzo, who's a, a producer of documentaries um, for Sky and for various other broadcasters. And he's been pulling together what we think is a great film on just that last 25 years and, and just trying to provide some perspective for future generations. A lot of kids in this room tonight who won't necessarily realise that we haven't always been in the Premier League or 25 years ago we were close to going out of business, going out of the league and this community would have lost its football club. So a lot of fantastic work by fans to save it. Great work by Dick Knight to, to, to keep the club alive when it, it, it really could have gone under. And then, of course, the last decade or more with Tony Bloom and his sort of vision for the club, creating what we've got today, which is a Premier League football club with some of the best facilities in world football. 
No, it is, a, it is an amazing... Uh, I've been learning as I've been doing this research, and it is an amazing story. And great in a way that you've made it, and you, so you've got control of how it looks and how it comes out. So in the new year... You said, where, where will we be able to watch it? Well, that's the, the next stage of the work, that the, the producers go off and, and sell it, whether it's to Amazon or Sky or to Netflix or Amazon, whoever wants to, to broadcast it. Um, we'll be looking to have a premiere in Brighton as well for the fans to be part of and, and to see it first. Um, but it's going to be 80, 90 minutes of pure Albion theatre, which is fantastic. Yeah, that is fantastic. I'm quite excited about that. Um, and so, Paul, you are clearly devoted to your job and you have a wife and three children. And I've just found out Roberto has two children. Uh, so I recently chatted with Eddie Hearn and his dad, Barry, wrote a tribute in his book. And the tribute was, to my family, you have always come first with business a close second. So I suppose what I'm asking is, how are you on the work-life balance Crikey, my wife's in the room. This is going to be oh, a difficult good. question to answer. How is he? Oh, there you are, darling. Yeah. I'll ask you to answer in a second. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> well, I mean, Roberto said it earlier that the problem with football is that it's a seven-day-a-week business. It's, it's all-consuming, and, and you can't switch off at 5 o'clock, and you can't switch back on at 9 o'clock. It, it, it takes up your life. And um, I've been lucky for two reasons. One, because my family have understood that, and they love football, so that helps to... Yeah create that sort of sense of understanding and, and, and secondly that I love what I do and I don't have any trouble getting up in the morning because going into work is a pleasure not a chore and you know working with with these guys working with top players for me is still a thrill you know I've been lucky enough to work at World Cups and European Championships and work in club football with 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 Tottenham and Vancouver and now Brighton and it still feels like one day I'm gonna wake up and I've got to get a proper job because this is yeah. such a special job, it sometimes doesn't feel real. And, um, you know, for that, I've got a lot of energy and a lot of enthusiasm. I love what I do, and hopefully I, I do it to the best of my ability. Don't get everything right, unfortunately, but, you know, in football, you, you have to make hundreds of decisions every week. He does, I do, the players do, and you just try and get as many right as you can. Yeah. So your, your work-life balance is oh, yeah, pretty I was good, to avoid I think. That question. Yeah, you weren't avoiding it very well. <laughs> I've got um, an answer. No, look, my no. work-life balance is what it is. It, it's, sometimes it's OK, and most of the time it's not. No, OK, thank you. And, so, and, and a few people know aware that when you grew up, you, you supported Tottenham Hotspurs from about the ages of seven to eight. And then you also worked with them in your early career. So when Brighton and Tottenham Hotspurs are playing each other... It has to be a Brighton win. Yeah, um, okay. And it's, it's the yeah. hardest time of yeah. uh, the season for me, those two games, but it has to be a Brighton win. After that, always a Brighton win, but obviously I look out for Spurs as well. And, you know, I grew up a mile from White Hart Lane and it was a, it was a real pleasure to, to, to work for the club. And, uh, yeah, I've been very lucky. I've worked for the national team, you know, my country um, and the club that I grew up supporting. But for the last 10 years, um, it's been a different kind of blue and white and I love it here as well. Yeah, Thank you. Beautifully answered. And so, Roberto, you said, I was a crazy player. You didn't love the rules. You didn't love a lot of your coaches. As a coach now, how would you deal with the young Roberto De Zerbi? I said I'm crazy. Stop. No, no I'm crazy player. I'm crazy. <laughs> yes. No. Uh, I don't know. Uh, because... Perché ero pesante come giocatore? Because like a player I was a very tough one. Ero insofferente, volevo sempre eh, le cose come le avevo io in testa. I was always complaining because I wanted the things making like they were in my brain. Ero un perfezionista già da giocatore. I was a perfectionist already when I was a player. Per cui mi piacerebbe avere un altro Roberto come giocatore. So I would like to have another Roberto like a player. Nei momenti un po' caldi non so come andrebbe a finire tra Roberto allenatore e Roberto giocatore. But in the hot moments, you know, I don't know how it will go between the head coach Roberto and the player Roberto. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, però... Di solito le persone passionali sono le persone più vere. Usually, passionate people are the true one. 
e le yeah. persone vere possono scontrarsi però dopo si torna come prima meglio di prima and the true people can have a fight but later on they are again the same as before and we can you know be friends like before so it's not a problem yeah I think or I better. think you'd be fine or better yeah you'd respect the passion in the player I want the passion in yeah you in want the, the passion in the players yes because the, the fans understand the passion yeah the journalist I don't know But the, the, the fans, no, but no, the journal is not, mm, non è una cosa brutta, eh, it's not... It's not anything better related to journalists. Però i tifosi la percepiscono subito. But the fans are able to feel it. E anche io come, eh, come Paul nasco tifoso. And as Paul, also me, you know, I was born in like a fan. Yeah. Thank you. So, Paul, you are also the board member for Women in Football. How did that, how did that come about? Uh, well, first of all, um, we've got a lot of female fans. Um, we've got a women's team. Um, we've got a lot of female staff. And we believe passionately in equality at, at the club. Um, and I've got two daughters, both of whom work in football, have worked in football. So I think it's really important to make sure that we give women every chance to progress in the game, that there are no glass ceilings, that no one uh, should consider women to be second rate when it comes to our sport. So I think one of the things that we, we committed to early on was creating male allies that supported women in the game. And Women in Football is an organization that, that provides that support. And um, it's great that Most of the board of women in football are women because that's absolutely right and proper, but it's also really important that two or three of us are, are, are men as well and provide that, that different level of support. So for me, combining professional um, support with personal support for my daughters who want to progress in the game um, was something I thought was really important. Absolutely. What, what, do your daughters, where, what are your daughters doing? Well, one of my daughters works at Liverpool um, and another one um, worked for us in our legal team and is now working for a law firm that works with Newcastle. So, um, right. yeah, they're both, uh, they're both involved in the game in different ways and, and hope to be for a long time to come. Okay, brilliant. So, Roberto, are there any specific objectives you plan to accomplish for the coming years being the head coach at Brighton and Hove Albion? In my work, uh, uh, my target is uh, improve the, the quality of play, improve, improve the, the quality of uh, result, and uh, finish the season uh, to finish the season uh, better than the last season no? mm. in terms of the place uh, in a table. And so, and before we came out, I just re we, I recently found out that you have eight players that have played in the World Cup. It's amazing, isn't it? I think that's worth a round of applause. But then, <laughs> so tell us a bit about the players them, that are out there. Well, for, I mean, first of all, eight players in this yeah. World Cup is more than Brighton have had in any World Cup in history combined. So it's really special for us as a football club to have eight players representing their countries at the highest level of the game. It does present some challenges for Roberto because obviously every game they play, we want them to play many minutes, but we also want them to get off the field without any injuries. So we're, we're always looking at the games very carefully. But, but as a football club, we should be very proud, and when we are, of, of those eight players. And of course, for Alexis McAllister at 23 years of age to be playing in a World Cup final with Lionel Messi Is, is quite something. I'm still in awe of that. Yeah, amazing. So my final question is to both of you. What advice would you offer to those who aspire to pursue a career in the football industry? My son play, plays football, no? Okay. Yes, and with him, uh, I never uh, spoke about uh, tactical situation. I... I told him always to enjoy, to respect the, the, the coach and the teammates, and uh, to put passion. Not uh, much time to, to, to think uh, in the result, or, or rather, only to enjoy and, and to put passion and to respect. Thank you. Uh, for me, it's about following your dream, 
um, working really hard and never giving up. And even if you don't make it as a player, um, there's so many opportunities in football that, that you could be good at. And it, it could be doing my job or it could be as a lawyer, as a doctor, mm. as, a, as, a, as, a, as an accountant, as a communications expert. There are so many jobs in football that you can follow your passion, follow your dream and work hard and never give up. Thank you. It's a lovely answer. So on that note, I'd like to say Paul, Roberto and Enrico, it's been a real pleasure this evening. Thank you for coming and talking to me. Thank you for your honesty. Um, please put your hands together. Thank you very much. A huge thank you to Paul and Roberto for taking time out from their extremely busy Premier League schedule to speak with us on all things football and what makes Brighton and Hove Albion just so special. Don't forget to let us know what you thought by rating and reviewing and make sure to keep an eye out for our up and coming episodes. We've got some good ones. <laughs>